Hi friends and family. Um, you might notice a change of scenery. I am what is called the Skype closet of the Cardalza, and that's literally what it is. It is a little closet, and it's kind of creepy, but um, roommates and stuff are doing homework, so <clears throat> thought I would come down here to make all my videos. So first of all, I went to Poland this weekend, and there's definitely going to be a part two to this video, I can already tell, so you probably noticed the title is marked part one. There's just so, so much in Poland that it's, it's insane. <laughs> so I guess I will, I'll just, I'll just start with day one. I'll just go through the itinerary, I suppose. Um, we left Thursday night at around 8 p.m. and we drove all through the night <laughs> And then we we got we got to this um, the city in Poland. I forget what it's called. Is it called Chesahova? Because, anyways, there is a shrine there to Our Lady of Chesahova. So I think so. I don't know. Don't quote me on that. But um, we got there at five thirty, and every morning they do this. It's an icon. If if you're not, um, a lot of you maybe don't know what that is. Um, I'll, I'll explain it in a minute. Anyways, they do this unveiling of it. There's like this big metal sheet in front of it and then they, they unveil it each morning at six in the morning. So we are sprinting across Poland to the shrine. It is freezing and it is icy having snowed all night. So all of us are slipping and sliding running trying to get to this shrine so we can see the unveiling of this icon. And um, <clears throat> um, we made it just in time. There was trumpets and everything. I mean, it was a really big deal. So it was cool to get to see. Now, Our Lady of Chesahova. Um, Father Brad told us this. He's kind of like our guy. Sorry, I keep moving this around. Um, I, I'm having it on my lap. A laptop on your lap? What do you know? Okay. So apparently, this is this is the story. This is they've traced it back. Um, Jesus <laughs> made Mary a table because he was a carpenter, you know. He made Mary a table. And um, this is kind of cool, actually. And St. Luke, who Mary uh, Mary is written about most in Luke's Gospel. So, just a little fun fact. Um, fo like, followers of St. Luke, you know, after after Christ descended to heaven, etc., etc., um, they, they really wanted, you know, the faithful really wanted an image of of the Madonna and child and they thought you know what St. Luke you were close to Mary and to Christ so you should you should do it so the story has it and I 100% believe this some people I guess there are skeptics but whatever St. Luke painted an image of Our Lady holding the child Jesus on the table that Jesus made for Mary so they have this, you know, big wooden, you know, flat part of the table with the image painted on it and, and they unveiled it and that's what, what we went to go see. So uh, there have been, um, it's been handed down. Um, I guess this one guy who had it handed down, he was going to take it to his, to his hometown and that was going to be where it was, the shrine was going to be built and it, whatever. But he stopped on his way with his horses, and I guess the horses, when he was ready to go, you know, he was done taking his restroom break or whatever, the horses wouldn't move. And they they just, like, wouldn't go any further, not even out of exhaustion. They just, like, would not move. So he took that as a sign from God that Our Lady, the picture, was, was, supposed, to, um, was supposed to be there. Now, in Poland, Poland's been taken over by pretty much everybody. Poor Poland. Um, so lots of people, you know, there's lots of jewels. People who have had their prayers answered will come and put strings of amber and silver and just everything to adorn the walls as a gift to Our Lady for what she's done for them. So lots of, lots of people want to take over the shrine, you know, back in the day when they were taking over Poland because it's, there's very valuable things in there. And, um, so I guess, you know, one time it got invaded in this... This robber, <clears throat> it was a bunch of people who, you know, th there wasn't really that many uh, gems and stuff there, 
because, you know, this was a really long time ago. So, I mean, now there's lots and lots and lots of gems and stuff like that in there. But um, back then there wasn't so much. And there was just, like, r religious articles, you know, chalices, all that kind of stuff. And um, so they were they were kind of upset, and they were all pretty sacrilegious. <clears throat> so they decided, well, fine, if, if there's nothing here for us to have, we're, we're just going to destroy things that are treasures to you. Um, you know, so they... They slaughtered priests, and they found this picture of Our Lady, and so one of the robbers, he slashed it once, he slashed it twice, he tried to slash it a third time, and he was struck down himself. Um, and so, you can see too, if you if you Google Our Lady of Chesterhoven and you see an image of it, there are two scratches near her face, and th that's what those are from. They tried to fix them, they tried to have a painter come in and, and fix the painting, and it the paint just slid off it just dripped off like it would not be fixed it's miraculously unfixable so um i don't know that's that's kind of cool so <clears throat> that was a really good um they had a really cool stations of the cross it was stations of the cross that kind of incorporated the holocaust into it so that was i mean that's just such a miraculous thing that they can unite their suffering with Christ's sufferings. Um, so yeah, moving on to that, we did go to Auschwitz, and you will, you'll see from my pictures there, I mean, there are no words, really, there are no words. Um, there's nothing I, I can say. Um, uh, it was, it was humbling, it was, you know, we're out there, it's, it's mostly outside, you know, walking from cell block to cell block, and, um, it's freezing cold, and you can only imagine, um, you know, we were in coats and boots and everything, and they were in striped pajamas, um, working, uh, on, on nothing, no food, you know, um, being beaten, uh, just all the atrocious things that happened there. Um, it was, it was mostly silent. We had a very friendly tour guide, you know, considering, uh, what we were being given a tour of, but, um, it was, yeah, you know, you're, you're kind of in shock at first. I mean, you see, you've seen Schindler's List, you've seen, or you've heard the story of Maximilian Colby, you've, uh, you know, just et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, we, we walk through the gates, work sets you free. Um, that's, that's a pretty, um, original gate to Auschwitz. So, um, when people think of Auschwitz, that's kind of what they think of. Um, and, uh, then we were walking, <clears throat> She's telling us some of the historical things. You know, you're trying not to cry <laughs> this whole time. And so we're walking, there's all these brick houses. You'll see, once you walk through the gate, there's all these brick, um, well, cell blocks, I guess. And uh, then finally you're reaching the end of the row and you, you come to cell block 11, which is where they kept everyone who was going to die. <laughs> people who had tried to escape, people who had helped people escape, um, anyone who they felt just didn't deserve to live anymore was in that cell block, including St. Maximilian Colby. So, <clears throat> right as I see the plaque on the thing that says cell block 11, I am just like, okay, like my eyes are tearing up and I'm just like, you can do this, we can get through this, you know what I mean? And I was just like trying to almost numb myself to it because it's just so hard thinking everybody in here, you know, died. And so we're walking down and then finally we get to Maximilian Colby's cell and there's a big candle in there that was placed there by John Paul II and it's, I just, I'm losing it. I just lose it. Uh, I could not keep it together. I mean, it's just, you know, he didn't even, he didn't even die there. He was starved there for two weeks. That's generally, they had different sections of the cell block that they used. 
some for starvation, some for people who weren't going to live the next 24 hours because they were just going to go out and shoot them the next day. And, you know, it was just... And she took us there. She took us to, you know, where they shot people. Like, the execution, like, it's just this big cement square with a wall, and they would just shoot them. And, um, you know, or in Maximilian Colby's case, if you survived the starvation, they took you to cell block 20. Uh, we didn't get to go inside, but of course I blessed myself walking by it, because that is where he died. And they, they would inject you then with something, and then and then you would die. So, um, that was just, wow. Um, you know, then they, a lot of the, the Germans, when they kind of knew it was over for them, and Americans were going to come liberate the camps and stuff like that, they, they started destroying documents that left any proof of the mass extermination they were doing. They destroyed actually a lot of their own gas chambers because they didn't, they didn't want, um, you know, anyone, anyone to know what they were doing, and, but they did leave one gas chamber open, and, um, or they didn't destroy one of them, and we got to go in there, and I lost it in there, too, because of just thinking, you know, they told these people they were going to go in there for a shower, and they, and they never came back out, you know, and being in there, and you almost, when you walk in, you almost get that sense of panic, like, you know what I mean, like, get me out of here, and I'm sure that's exactly how they felt. Get me out of here, you know? And it's just, um, you know, it's it's the smallest bit of solidarity I could ever have. Um, I needed to be exposed to that. I needed to be exposed to everything um, because I, being an American, I just have never witnessed a horror um, quite like that in my own country. Um, so, you know, I... They, they had a memorial at the end of these train tracks. They had a memorial, which is, I'm almost, I'm pretty sure it's the one depicted in Schindler's List where they set, at the end of the movie, they're setting the rocks on it. And it says, let this be a warning to humanity. And please, if you are here and you are seeing this, um, never let this happen again. You know, that's a message to the youth to never let this happen again. And that was really moving. We... Our whole group knelt down and said a Divine Mercy Chaplet um, for for everybody. You know, the Nazis, <laughs> their souls, um, the souls of all who were dying, you know, in the camps. And it was a really powerful, really difficult um, situation. You know, they, they showed us, they had a museum. They turned some of the cell blocks into museums. And they did keep, like, you'll see in pictures and history books, you know how they kept everybody's belongings like they would pile all the shoes together and they would pile everything together they have that at the camps they there's thousands and thousands of people's shoes thousands of suitcases that never got unpacked um they would shave their heads when they got to the camp they had i feel i don't remember the number but it was like thousands of kilos of hair and there was there was this huge tank in one of the cell blocks that they showed us full of women's hair some of it was still braided um you know they just and they used, they used the hair. They used it to make mattresses and blankets and stuff for the troops. And they just used humans as means to an end. They really did use them as natural resources uh, for their efforts. And it was just, like, absolutely horrifying. And, um, you know, but we need, we need to have exposure to that. We don't have anything like that in the States. We don't have anything even close to compare it to. And movies really don't do it justice. I mean, I know you sit in a classroom and you're like, okay, yeah, we, like, we've talked about the hol Holocaust. Like, I know who Hitler is. It, it doesn't, nothing will do it justice. Even me going there and walking in the footsteps of former prisoners doesn't do it justice because we just have no idea. There's no way we could ever know what they went through. No matter how many books you read, how many pictures you look at, how many concentration camps you've walked into. You will never know that horror, but you need you need to try to know it because you need to make sure it doesn't happen again. And that's exactly why they keep the camps open. That's exactly why they have give tours, you know, because we we need to love each other. We need to respect each other no matter what our differences are. And we need to have knowledge of each other instead of just getting scared of the unknown and 
exterminating each other. Because there are holocausts going on, there is holocausts of unborn babies in our country right now. And, you know, people people look at the Holocaust and go, how did that happen? Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I have to move on to part two because this is just running out.